right, last time we started in with sort of a prelude of what we were going to cover this semester, and we kind of gave an overview on scripting, and we got so far as the client side, and, oh, I'm sorry, we got so far as the server side, and we talked about the role of the server in, um, in the, the client-server scripting environment. So, if I could pop up that diagram one more time. I'm surprised, well, I'm not in this classroom that often. I was, was going to say, I'm surprised that that diagram isn't like burned into the board, like, you know, like on a CRT, the images get burned into. We have our client, which again is someone running a browser for the most part. Not exclusively, could be a bot that is crawling the web, interview, internet, connected through the internet, and the server on the other end. Now, we'll flesh this out in a second here. The important thing to remember, a few important things to remember, this is, again, we don't know a lot about this client. This client could be a mobile device. It could be a desktop device. And ideally, this scenario is going to work regardless of the kind of client it is. But the client makes a request. The server processes it and formulates a response. That's sort of the very simplistic view. A more detailed view would say that when the client makes a request, they can also pass some data, like via a form, for example, a form where you enter in your user ID and password, a form where you enter in what you want to search for, all right, and other pieces of data about the environment. that the request is made by. In other words, the operating system that is that the, that the client is running, the, the browser that the client is running, the IP address that the client is running, uh, is, is using, rather. All right? Which, in turn, can be used to by the server to figure out the location of the person, of the client. All right? So the request comes over, and it contains is a request for a URL, and in addition, data can be passed and environment information can be passed. The server then, in the case of static pages, simply gathers up all the files that are needed and delivers them. In the case of a server-side scripting, a dynamic site, the server actually goes through a process to formulate those pages. It effectively writes those pages on the fly. All right. In other words, when you write server-side scripting, you're not writing web pages. You're writing a program to write a web page. All right. Because sometimes students will say, "Well, if we have to learn PHP, why do we learn HTML?" Well, you learn HTML because that's what your PHP is going to write. So, if you're writing the PHP, you better know the HTML that that code is going to be writing. So. In the case of static, the files are already out there and just get delivered. In the case of dynamic pages, instructions are executed, processed by the server, and there may be interaction with a database or other external entities. The bottom line, though, is when the day is done, the response coming back to the client is in the same form regardless. It is going to be a web page. It's going to be a collection of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Because that's what browsers know. That's the kind of responses that the browser is expecting and the kind of uh, response that the browser 
needs to display on the screen. Now to be sure, the browser can do things with other kinds of files, but our main focus is going to be on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So if I was going to define what the server-side script does, the server-side script is takes a request, does some sort of processing to formulate the response. In other words, server-side scripting is responsible for writing a web page, for creating a web page in response to a request. Creates it on the fly. Because it's creating on the fly, it can be up to date. All right. If you are looking at a product on eBay and you look at the product for, you know, you look at a, a snowblower on eBay, all right, and click the refresh button, if someone in Idaho just made a bid on it, you're going to see the new price immediately because that page is created dynamically on the fly each time. So that's what server-side scripts are responsible for, for taking a request and creating the web page specifically for that response. Now one thing to note, this trip from the client through the internet to the server and back takes a little bit of time. All right. Now again, we're not talking about days or, or months. Well, sometimes maybe it seems that way, but relatively speaking, that kind of, that request takes a long time to process compared to how fast a client can process code and how fast a server can process the code. So even on a fast connection, the time that that request and response are traveling through the internet really takes up a fair amount of time. All right? And with a standard web site, the request and response interaction is clunky, all right, with a traditional or standard um, website. That is, every time a request is made, an entire web page is returned to the user. So, for example, if you go on and log into Angel and you see a list of classes, you click um, one of the classes, it's bringing up a whole page. You click another class, it's bringing up a whole another page. All right? And so on down the line. That's sort of a clunky interaction because the, the, the client has to redraw the page each time the server has to send back an entire page each time. Because of that, if there's anything, there's any functionality that can be offloaded to the client via JavaScript, it can make things run a lot better and a lot easier and a lot smoother. Because if that code, once that code gets delivered, that code can get executed virtually instantaneously. All right, so it doesn't have to, to execute JavaScript that's been loaded within the client's browser, it doesn't require a trip through the internet and back. That code can just be executed right then and there, and the response can be immediate. Let me show you an example of that, of exactly what I mean.
made a request, typing in a URL in the address bar and clicking return is making a request. All right. That request made it through the internet and hit ESPN server. ESPN sent back the pages. Now, notice as we put our mouse on these items, the page changes. But notice that it changes virtually instantaneously. All right. In other words, if I go and click on this page, notice it took a little bit of time for that to happen. Why? Because that was a request to the server. So my request for the NBA homepage had to go through the internet, hit ESPN server, ESPN server had to do whatever it needed to do with it, and then send a response back. So that was the kind of request that we had up on the board. Initially loading the page and clicking on the link for the MBA was that sort of request where the request went through the internet, server processed it, and returned the result. Now, you can tell this is somehow different, right? This is somehow different in two ways. What are the two ways that this kind of action is different than clicking on a link? What's one way that it's different? You don't have to click. You don't have to click. That's true. It doesn't the right. The whole page doesn't change. All right. In other words, if I was going to describe that, this, this is a modification of an existing page. This isn't requesting. I'm not getting back a whole brand new page. I'm just simply changing a page that's already loaded. In other words, that MBA page is still there, right? As I go and put my mouse over this and that, the page is still there. It's just that it changes. It, 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 what used to be this stuff here gets replaced by a menu. So that pops over the menu. What's another difference? I kind of alluded to this. It happens virtually instantaneously. All right. In other words, it doesn't take like clicking on a page. You don't sit there and wait and see the screen being drawn and all that. It happens like that. This is a classic example of client-side scripting. In other words, when the initial request was made, when I clicked on that MBA link from the home page, what did I get back from the server? I got back from the server a package that contained HTML, the content of the page, CSS, how to format and how the, the appearance of the page, and finally JavaScript, which controls some interactivity on the page, controls behavior of the page. Now the interesting thing is, is included in that HTML was the HTML for all those menus that you saw pop up. They were just made hidden through the CSS. All right? And the JavaScript then simply displays and hides them based on when you put your mouse on the, the, the NHL, the NHL menu, menu appears. You pull your mouse off of that and put it on NASCAR, HTML uh, or the uh, NHL menu disappears and the NASCAR menu appears, and so on down the line. So. Server-side scripting creates most of the time creates a whole new page where client-side scripting alters an existing page. When it's used properly, client-side scripting is like a win-win situation. It benefits both the client and the server. How does it benefit the client? You don't have to wait. Right. You put your mouse over that, instantly that menu pops up. So you don't have to sit there and wait for the menu to draw and so on. How does it benefit the server? Less demands on the server. Less demands on the server. Exactly. 
In other words, the server doesn't have to be bothered with doing little things like, well, gee, they want to see the NHL menu. So here, let me go and let me generate the page. That, let me generate the same page that they're viewing now, except with the NHL menu visible. All right, that's something that can just as, as well be done on the JavaScript side, on the client side, and it's beneficial to both parties in this transaction. All right? The client gets an immediate response. Could you imagine how clunky these kind of menus would be if when you put your mouse on it, you had to wait for a second and then the page redisplayed? They, they wouldn't be usable if, if you had to do it that way. All right? However, because you get the immediate response from the client side JavaScript, it is a useful tool. And as I stated, less demands put on the server. All right? I guess the analogy I would give to this, I think I was talking in food analogies last week. The analogy I would give here would be like how if you go to a restaurant, um, they put salt and pepper and ketchup and hot <coughs> sauce and other stuff right on your table. Right? Why do they do that? Well, could you imagine if every time you wanted another sprinkle of salt on your fries, you had to get back up in line and wait for the server to be ready to handle you and say, gee, can you sprinkle a little more salt on my fries? And they'd salt it, and you'd go back to your table and start eating and think, well, you know, it needs just a pinch more, and then have to get in line again. That'd be a hassle. I don't think the server working at that McDonald's would be very amused by it. The server has some stuff that, that only the server can do, right? But the client, the customer in the restaurant or the browser, can do some things on their own as well and can do some things on their own just as well or better than the server can in this case. So, JavaScript allows us to alter an existing page and kind of a word that goes closely with this concept is the idea of interactivity. I suppose clicking on a link is one form of interactivity where you click on a link and the whole new page displays. But this is kind of a cooler, slicker interactivity. In other words, you do something and the page responds immediately. All right? The user does something, that is put their mouse over a link or over some text and the page responds by displaying some different content. And you can see, you see this in, in all sorts of applications. Can anyone think of some similar functionality to this that maybe isn't drop-down menus or, or, or menus like this, but another way that you can, you can make a change to the page that appears to happen instantaneously? Yes? Okay, that's a good example. Some web pages you can change the color uh, scheme. And all that's going to do is it's going to change the appearance, but it probably doesn't need to reload the whole page. It probably just needs to change the CSS. So that would be one example. Um, on emails, you can change like, the spacing for like viewing Okay. Okay, right, right. A lot of, yeah, a lot of email applications and a lot of that, you can actually change the way things are laid out, you know, and, and in Angel, for example, you can show or hide things if you want to, um, and you can switch between, uh, like you can see your tasks if you want to, or you can see this or that, so yeah, you could click on, in a discussion forum, you can click on the little plus sign to see all the questions, or all, all the answers, responses to uh, a, a discussion question uh, within a discussion forum. Another good one is like with a photo gallery where you have thumbnails that when the user clicks on or puts their mouse over, the big picture changes and you see a, a bigger picture, bigger version of the thumbnail. So all those are sort of examples of this JavaScript where you're taking a page that's already been delivered and you're changing it a little bit to allow for some interactivity and you're doing it in a, in a way that... Um, what I'm going to say, you're doing that in a way that it is seamless. So it doesn't require a trip back to the server. Yeah. Yes? Um, on my Kindle, I can change like, the font or the way the text is justified. Is that an example of JavaScript as well? Or... 
well, a, a Kindle is different because with a Kindle, you're not viewing an HTML page. All right. Um, if that was done as a web page, that would very likely be an example of JavaScript because there are similar things like that where you can go in and change that. So, but yeah, yeah, that would be, if there was functionality like that on a web page, that would more than likely be uh, implemented via JavaScript. Other questions? Yes. Would um, some web pages allow a translation? Like if it's in a different language, does uh -huh. that qualify as JavaScript? Or is that translation. Like well, it depends. Depends specifically how it's done. All right. Keep in mind that, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can implement any functionality. All right. So what I'm trying to describe is, is typical uses of JavaScript. Something like that, a translation, that could be done in JavaScript. It could be done in, uh, through server-side scripting. It would depend on the nature of the kind of thing. So, for example, and you can kind of tell what it is by, like, if you click on the link to translate it and it happens immediately, it's probably JavaScript. If you click on the link and there's a pause and then it shows you the other version, it's probably server-side scripting. Or they simply have two versions of the same page that, that they're switching between. All right. You'll see that with international companies. You'll have like a, like a, 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 a either like a U.S. flag and maybe a French flag or a German flag, and you click on that. You actually go to a different website, a slightly different website. So again, some of these things can be done a whole bunch of different ways, and you'd really have to look at the specific example. Now, there's one last thing that we need to talk, and it, it, it's not. A new kind of scripting is a new kind of way to use client and server scripting. And to do it in an even more seamless way, and, and to do it in a way that takes the advantages of both of these tools. The advantage of the server side is that the server side can do the heavy lifting. All right? That is, the server can interact with databases. The server can do processing. The server can customize things for a particular person and can do all these intensive processing. JavaScript is mainly used for small things like changing the way the appearance of a pre-existing page. If you combine these two things, you get what are called AJAX applications. And that is where you sort of get the best of both worlds. Whereas you make a request to the server, but it's not a request for an entire web page. It's a request for just a little bit of content. All right? And the server, the server's job is serving up content. The client's job is manipulating appearance. Let me rephrase that. that. These are the things that they're good at. Servers are good at providing content, looking up stuff in databases and that kind of stuff. The client is good at manipulating the appearance. In other words, change this page to look this way and that way. When these things are done in a very seamless way back and forth, actually there is a request made through the internet, but it's a different kind of request. All right? It doesn't get back a whole page, it just gets back a little piece of content. And then the JavaScript formats that content to display the new page. And this is probably better demonstrated than talked about. Because the classic example where you see this is with Google. Let's wait a second for that to show up. All right. I'm sitting here typing. I 
made my request to go to www.google.com. All right. Google server responded with a web page. And that web page contains HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Watch what happens when I start typing. I'll type the letter P. The page changed. Notice that the URL didn't change at all. Notice that it happened in, uh, instantaneously. All right? And if you watch the status bar down there, it didn't make a request to the server. Like sometimes if you make, if you like click on something, you'll notice the status bar down there says that it's going to the server. Whereas in the case of Google, all right, it said waiting for Google when I initially loaded it. But when I start typing, there's no message down there that says, hey, it's waiting for Google server. It happens instantaneously. That's a clue that this is being done with JavaScript. Or maybe I should change that to say that's a clue that JavaScript is coming into play somehow in this example. Now notice what happens as I continue typing. I type in an H. I see the most popular requests that, according to Google, that start with PH. So I type PHP. All right. The more I type, the page changes. And the page changes to show the top four search terms for what I've typed in so far. Now, we can sort of, in our mind, reverse engineer this and figure out what piece of this is happening on the client and what piece of it is happening on the server. All right? First of all, we can tell that the client side comes into play somehow because we're clearly not reloading the whole page. That's happening very quickly. And we don't see the screen flicker, like when you click on a link and the page disappears for a second and then is redrawn. So that happens virtually instantaneously. So that manipulation is done on the client side. And yet, does my client computer, is my client computer itself on its own, able to access Google's massive databases of data that contain the most common search terms and stuff like that? No. Servers are content providers. Servers provide content to the client. So as I type in, I'm getting content changed. So in this case, the server is responsible for the content that changes. The client is responsible for the appearance that changes. So as I type something in, a request is made, but a different kind of request is made to the server. I'm not asking for a whole new web page. I'm asking for a chunk of content, just a piece of content. And the client's going to take that piece of content and format it to change the way the page looks. So as I change what's typed in, that box changes. So in this case, the server's providing the content, and the client is formatting it. Now, what's the difference between this and the standard um, the standard model that we went over a second ago, the difference is, is this happens without rewriting the whole page. So a standard request isn't made. A special kind of request is made where the client asks the server not for a whole web page, but just for like a piece of a web page, a chunk of content. And then it's the client's job to reformat the web page to accommodate that new content. Now you see Ajax a lot in a lot of sites that are very heavily interactive. All right. Um, in Facebook, for example, if you like a status, you know, if, if three people like the status and you click the little thumbs up to like it, instantly you see that 
3 change to a 4. And anyone else in the world would see that 3 change to a 4 if they were viewing that status. If you use Gmail, all right, if you leave your Gmail screen up and someone sends you an email, boom, that new email will pop up on the top of the list without you having to refresh your page. All right. These are all examples where the client and the server work in a more integrated fashion to provide a very interactive web page. All right. And these techniques are known as AJAX. All right. So AJAX isn't a different programming language or anything like that. It's just a new way to use client-side scripting plus server-side scripting to make for a richly interactive site. So, this course, all right, that's sort of the main topics that we're going to cover this course. This course consists of three parts, client-side scripting, server-side scripting, and then finally bringing those two tools together to make AJAX, all right? Questions at this point? All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to get on the client side. We're going to start out the sequence we're going to do this in is we're going to do client side first, we're going to do server side, and then we're going to do AJAX. Now, if you remember, what is the purpose of client side scripts? The purpose of client side scripts are manipulating the appearance of existing web pages. So when the client makes a, script, uh, a request to the server, what does the server deliver? What does the client get in its package? It gets code in three different languages. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, depending on the web page, you get some mix of those. You know, there could be a web page out there that has no CSS. It's pretty rare these days, but it's possible. I don't think you'd ever have a page that had no HTML, but you would on occasion have pages that have no JavaScript. Now to be sure, nearly all pages today, because they want to give the rich experience, you will get all three of these. But again, it's not an absolute necessity. Each of these three languages are responsible for something. And we can describe it in, in a few words or phrases, each of them. What is the HTML? What does the HTML contain? The, you, you said the hard-coded part? Yeah, the part that's constant. Does that make sense? The part that's constant? That, that makes sense if you recognize that constant, constant for this web page. In other words, if the HTML was generated by a server-side script, then that HTML won't be constant. In other words, if me and you both log into Angel, we're going to get different HTML. All right? You use the word content. I think that's 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 a good way to describe it. The content of the page is represented in HTML. So the text, the images, the links, all that stuff are represented in HTML. All right. What does CSS provide? Format. Format. Does anyone care to expand on that? Appearance. Appearance. So you want to add to that. These are all, these are all right. I just want to maybe get a different slant on it. Order. Order. In other words, to say, or, another word for order would be the layout. I want to add to the definition 
definition of what HTML provides, in addition to content, it provides the structure of the page. The structure and the layout are closely related, but they are two different things. All right? In other words, the structure of a page would say, I have a navigation section, and then I have a content section. My page is broken up into two sections, and there's tags for each of these two sections. There's tags in a nav section, and then there's a section tag that contains the content. All right? So that is the logical structure of the page. The physical layout of this page, we could lay this out a million different ways, right? We could lay it out with the navigation on the top and the content underneath it. We could lay it out like this with the nav and the content. We could lay it out with the content on top and the nav on the bottom. And so on. Okay, maybe not a million different ways, but there's three at least, and we could probably think of a few more. So, the idea is, is the content and the structure are, the, or the structure and the layout are related, but there's there's a slightly different twist on it. All right, you know, think of it this way: the content um, is that we have, the content is that we have. Sixteen, if I counted right, tables in this room. All right, sixteen tables in this room, maybe seventeen, because I forgot that one. The layout says is that we have a section for the instructor and a section for, or the, the structure says that we have a section for the instructor and a section for the students. The layout says is that the tables for the students are arranged in two columns. One column is wider than the other column, and then there's an aisle between them, and so on. So content, structure, layout. All right. Ideally, the layout will reinforce the structure and make it clear to your readers that this is the structure of the page. In other words, if you came into this classroom and never had a class in here before, and someone asked you, where does the instructor stand? Without ever having a class in here, you'd know, just by the way the furniture is laid out, that this is where the instructor stands, that's where the student sits. right? We want the same sort of thing for our web pages. We want people at a glance to understand, oh, that's the navigation section, even without thinking about it, simply by being good in the way that we lay out the content on our page. So we lay out the content on our page in a way that reflects the structure of the page. Knowing, of course, that there are many alternatives on how you can do it. And you just have to decide the best one for each particular circumstance. Now, where does JavaScript come in? What does JavaScript bring to the, to the party? It lets you change a lot, like you said. OK. All right, change the appearance. Possibly the layout to some extent. And the layout, that's a good point. If you noticed in Google, and I have to say, I have to confess, this is one thing I'm not crazy about, and I'm even less crazy about it on my phone. If you go out to, to Google on my cell phone, when you start typing in the search box, it actually takes you up to the address box. And that's like disorienting for me. I, I don't know why. I, I, I'm, I've kind of gotten used to it. and I, I'll survive, I think. But, um, and if you notice, when we typed in Google, when we start typing in the search bar in the middle of the thing, 
that bar popped up to the top of the page. So yeah, we changed not just the appearance, we changed the layout of the page as well. All right. Now, that's very true. I want to add something to that. And that is it can do that without requiring a request to the server. All right. Now, in the case of Ajax, there is a request to the server, but in the case of the pull-down menu, there wasn't a request to the server. We changed that page. We made a menu visible without going back to the server. Anyone else think of another way to put that for JavaScript? Yes? I think the JavaScript features. Features? All right. Okay, that's a good way to put it. This is the, the body. Close. And what did you say for this? Abilities. Abilities. Um, it's funny because uh, the when, when I teach a multimedia class, we talk about uh, typography and fonts and all that. And we actually use that analogy. We say fonts are the clothes that your letters wear. All right? And the clothes tell you something about, you know, uh, about that. You know, when I walked in wearing two jackets, right, you, you knew instantly that it's, a, well, you probably knew before then, but if you were, say, beamed into here from, from Rio, you'd know that it was a cold day today because I had that. You know something about that that adds extra meaning. Another word that sort of summarizes what you said, and I like the way you, you talked about it in terms of features or abilities, is it adds behavior. In other words, a page can do something. I guess another thing I would say would be interactivity. Now, it's important to keep these things separate to as great a degree as you can. Now, you've, uh, all of you, I assume, have had the CISS 216 class. And in that class, we stress keeping the HTML and the CSS separate. Don't put anything in your HTML that has to do with appearance. So, for example, break tags, you know. A lot of students are like, why, why do you get so annoyed when people use break tags? I don't really get annoyed, but you, you know what I mean. All right. The reason I do is because a break tag, most of the time when you use it, you're doing it to, ch to simply change the appearance of the page. And that's something that could easily be done by simply adding like a bottom margin or something like that. And the advantage is, is that if I choose to get rid of that extra space, all I have to do is change the CSS. Whereas if I choose to change it and I've used break tags, I have to go down, track down all the break tags and get rid of all of them. So it makes it more maintainable. Remember, most of the things that we do in coding that we say is a good idea, good practice to do, is because it makes our life easier when we go to change it. All right, maintainability. So our best bet in writing good web pages and in writing good JavaScript is to follow the separation that we stressed in CISS 2.16. That is a separation between the content and structure, which is in HTML, and the layout and appearance, which is in CSS. All right, JavaScript has three aspects to it, all right? And we'll look into this. We'll probably get through one quick JavaScript example, all right? There is user events. We talked about functionality or interactivity or abilities. 
these things usually get kicked off based on the user doing something. That's the whole idea of interactivity is the user does something and the page responds to it. Okay? So, typically with JavaScript there's going to be user events which usually correspond, or events, or user events, which usually correspond to the user doing something on the page. In the case of Google, we started typing. In the case of um, the ESPN, with the menus, you put your mouse over a menu. All right? Those are user events. Second thing we have is the DOM. The DOM stands for Document Object Model. And the third piece is the JavaScript itself. The DOM is the way that we point to something on the page in order to um, change it. If I want to say I want to make something visible or I want to make something invisible, we have to be able to point to specifically the thing that we want to make visible or invisible. So yes. Um, typically, it's not the class but the ID. Because tip, yeah. Because tip, yeah. Because typically we want to point to just one thing uniquely as opposed to all of the things that fit a certain class. Right. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can use a DOM to point to things, but ID is the common one. Let's put uh, a real quick example. I think it's an example we had similar in CISS 216. I guess, I, I guess depending on what you took at. But We'll start this example today, and this example will be uh, expanded upon in future classes. I'm going to put the shell of an HTML document. Now, if you've not learned HTML5 before, I'm going to use HTML5 in my examples. If you have any questions about that, let me know. put a question up here. Who was the third U.S. president? Who was the third U.S. president? Jefferson. Thank you. Thomas Jefferson. All right. I put a ID in there because we're going to need it in a second. We're actually going to go a little bit long today, but that's okay. I know I'm very entertaining, so I know you won't mind. All right. 
So let me go up here and let me save this as quiz. All right. So there we have all HTML, right? No JavaScript, no CSS, no anything. disappear. Set the ID to hidden. Now, there's a couple ways that we can do this. So, and when you say set the ID to hidden, using what? Using CSS. Using CSS, right? The content stays the same. The only difference is we're not going to show the answer. So, I'm going to do style. In the interest of time, I'm not creating a separate style sheet. All right. And I'll say an ID of answer. A couple ways we could do this. I'm going to say a display of none. All right. So now I click refresh and it's gone. All right. So how can I make it appear? Well, this is going to require JavaScript, right? Because I'm going to make a change to the page without asking for the page again. So one way I could do it is I could make a button. I use a user event. What do I want to do? When they click on the button, I want something happens. So I'll put on click equals. What do I want to do? I want to point to the thing named answer. That is done with the, with the DOM expression document get element by ID. And I put the ID. I want to change its style. I want to change its display. And I want the display to no longer be none, but I want to display it as a block tag. Now, if you're not understanding this completely, that's okay. We'll go over this next time. I'm kind of rushing just to get this example in. But this contains really all of the parts that I laid out on the board. The user event, we're going to do something when they click on the button. The DOM expression, this allows us to point to the thing called answer and change the style of it and change the display type to block. And then finally, this is a JavaScript statement. So we'll go in here, refresh. When I click that, boom, the answer appears. All right. We'll pick up on this next time and we'll review this and expand upon it. But I wanted to sort of complete the picture to show you how these three things work together to provide this bit of functionality.